Okay, then uh, welcome everyone to another YRQG seminar. Uh, this seminar, we actually start a mini series of three talks on quantum cosmology. And our first speaker is Robert Brandenberger from McGill University. Robert studied at the ETH Zurich and then went then afterwards to Harvard University where he received his PhD in 1983. After that, he held postdoc positions at the KITP in Santa Barbara and at the University of Cambridge. He became then a faculty at Brown University in 1987 and stayed there till 2004. Since then, he holds a research chair at McGill University. Robert received multiple awards and honors, among them the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship and the Fellowship of the Physical American Physical Society. Um, Robert is a theoretical cosmologist, and he contributed over the years to many very different areas of cosmology. For example, cosmic defects, baryogenesis, structure formation, inflation, and also alternatives to inflation. And I think about this uh, last point, we'll probably hear more today in his talk on emergent metric space time from a matrix model, uh, which opens our mini series on quantum cosmology. So thank you very much for accept accepting our invitation, Robert, and please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great. So thanks a lot for the <clears throat> invitation to give this presentation to young researchers in quantum gravity. So as you already mentioned, Tobias, I'm not a quantum gravity expert myself. I'm a theoretical cosmologist. But I believe that cosmology needs input from quantum gravity. And cosmology also provides the venue to test quantum gravity. So I think the interaction between quantum gravity and theoretical cosmology is very important. So the title of my talk, as you see, is Emergent Metric Space-Time from a Matrix Model. But there are some other messages which I would like to convey you, to convey to you. So you probably all know that the inflationary scenario is the current paradigm of early universe cosmology. And if you've been taught inflation, then you've probably been taught inflation in the context of an effective field theory analysis. Now, what I want to persuade you of is that there are fundamental conceptual problems for an effective field theory description of any rapidly expanding universe. And this in particular affects inflation. And these are not problems of detail, but they're issues which hit at the fundamentals. So there's the issue of unitarity or inconsistency with the second law of thermodynamics. So I will try to persuade you at the beginning of the talk that inflation, the way we usually treat it, is uh, non-unitary and inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics. And if you buy this argument, then you will conclude that if we want to understand the early universe, we have to look beyond an effective field theory description. So these are some of the main messages I want to convey to you. And if you buy these uh, messages, then we have to try to look beyond. And the way that we are trying to look beyond is to start with a non-perturbative matrix model, which was proposed as a non-perturbative definition of superstring theory by Banks, Fischer, Schenker, and Susskind. And we are trying to see what kind of early universe cosmology could emerge from this model. So specifically, this is the outline of the talk. I will first discuss the problems of the usual analysis of early universe cosmology, specifically focusing on the trans Planckian censorship criterion. And then I will tell you that inflation is not the only scenario of early universe cosmology which is consistent with current data. I will give you criteria which is successful early universe cosmology will have to satisfy. And uh, I think this is very important for the audience because some of you might be constructing new models of early universe cosmology coming from better models of quantum gravity 
and I will give you a list of criteria which your models have to satisfy. And I will introduce you to one toy model, which is string gas cosmology. So this should probably take two thirds of the talk. Then I will turn to the specific avenue which we are following, which is starting from the BFSS matrix model, we are trying to get an emergent space-time, an emergent metric, and an emergent early universe cosmology. So this is the outline of the talk. So let's first focus on the problems of our standard descriptions of early universe cosmology. And here's a space-time diagram that I want to start out with. It's a space-time di time diagram of inflation. So the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is space, the physical spatial coordinate, and uh, zero is a big bang. The period between T sub i and T sub r, that's a period of inflation during which the universe is expanding exponentially. Now in this di diagram, I plotted various length scales. The first length scale is the horizon, which is the distance that light could have traveled from some initial Cauchy surface close to the Big Bang. And in the phase where space expands exponentially, obviously the horizon expands exponentially as well. Now, the second length scale, which I will focus on is the Hubble radius. And the Hubble radius is a local concept. It is the inverse expansion rate. And in the period of inflation, the expansion rate is constant. And so the Hubble radius is constant during inflation. After inflation, it expands linearly in time. Now, in cosmology, we are interested in explaining data. And the data concerns anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background and inhomogeneities in the distribution of matter. And you should visualize these inhomogeneities and anisotropies as small plane wave, small amplitude plane wave fluctuations on the expanding background. And the wavelength expands in proportion to the radius of the background space. And the length scale of such an inhomogeneity, this is the red curve. And during the period where space expands exponentially, obviously the wavelength of fluctuations also expands exponentially. So the success of inflation is the fact that the wavelength of fluctuations, which we observe today on large scales in the universe, for example, the quadrupole of the cosmic microwave background, they emerge on length scales smaller than the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation which is illustrated in this red curve crossing the solid blue line. So since this wavelength is smaller than the Hubble radius, it is possible to conceive a locally causal generation mechanism of fluctuations. And you can ask me later what I mean by locally causal. So the success of inflation is that this red line starts out smaller than the Hubble radius at early times. But now from the point of view of quantum gravity, there's another very important length scale, which is the Planck length, or maybe the string length. And I think you all people working on quantum gravity will know that effective field theory breaks down on length scales smaller than the Planck length. So the problem which Jean Martin and myself discussed um, more than 20 years ago, when most of you were in kindergarten or maybe not even born yet, uh, is that if inflation lasts a little bit longer than it has to last in order for this red curve to become smaller than the Hubble radius, then the red curve will actually start out in this zone of ignorance. So we argued back a long time ago that effective field theory breaks down and new physics must be taken into account when computing observables from inflation. Now, based on this space-time diagram, based on this problem, Bedroya and Waffer posited what they called the Transplankian censorship conjecture. And they, this uh, conjecture postulates that no 
cosmology consistent with quantum gravity can feature trans Planckian modes exiting the Hubble horizon. So this feature, which I discussed, which I showed in the red line here, namely things that we observe today start out on scales smaller than a Planck length can simply never occur. Quantum gravity prohibits that. So mathematically, this means the following. If we take the usual metric of a homogeneous and isotropic universe, T is physical time, X are the co-moving coordinates, which expand as space expands. A of T is the scale factor, which tells us how fast space expands. H is the Hubble expansion rate. Then the trans Planckian censorship conjecture says that if we start at any initial time T sub i with a Planck length, and we let this length evolve until any later time T sub r, you have to remain smaller than the Hubble radius at time T sub r. So Bedroya and Waffa made connections between this censorship conjecture and string theory, but I'm now going to give you three, um, three arguments in support of this trans Planckian censorship conjecture, which are completely general. They are independent of string theory. And the first is paraphrasing Penrose's famous black hole censorship conjecture. So you all know that if you take a black hole with charge smaller than a mass, R is the distance from the center of the black hole. You all know that there's a singularity lurking at the center of the black hole, but the observer outside of the horizon it does not see the singularity, is shielded from the singularity by this horizon. So none of the bad stuff that happens at, that is associated with the singularity can affect the observer. However, Einstein's equations admit solutions where the charge is bigger than the mass. And if quantum gravity were to admit such solutions, then you would have the problem that an observer even far away from the black hole would see the bad stuff associated with the singularity. <clears throat> and so Penrose argued that even though the effective field theory of general relativity allows for such pathological solutions with time-like singularities, that quantum gravity will prohibit them. So let's now take Penrose's censorship conjecture and let's translate that from black hole physics to cosmology. And this is the translation scheme. Position space for black holes becomes momentum space for cosmology. The singularity in the center of a black hole is replaced by the set of trans Planckian modes. And the black hole horizon is replaced by the Hubble horizon. And so if, if you now translate Penrose's censorship conjecture used in this translation scheme to cosmology, then you find that an observer measuring only super Hubble horizon modes must be shielded from the bad stuff from the trans Planckian modes. This is precisely the trans Planckian censorship conjecture. Um, sorry for interrupting here. I think there's a, a raised hand, uh, Linda. Yeah, yeah, that's me. We got an anonymous question. Uh, and the question is, how does Lorentz symmetry emerge, including isotropy? How does Lorentz symmetry emerge? Yes. Uh, let me postpone this to the end of the talk, because you can ask this question in the model in which, um, which I will present. So usual cosmology is locally Lorentz invariant because general relativity and, uh, and the matter actions have local Lorentz invariance built in. So that's how the usual theory answers the question. But now you have to ask the question in any quantum gravity model, how does local Lorentz invariance emerge at low energies? And I will address that in the last third of the talk. Okay. Now, when I translated Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture from black hole physics to cosmology, I was replacing the horizon by the Hubble horizon. And the reason I was doing that is that if you look at inhomogeneities in cosmology, they only oscillate on sub-Hubble scales and they freeze out and become classical on super-Hubble scales. So using the Hubble horizon, as our boundary 
is a very mild constraint. It just says that we want the classical region to be insensitive to transplankian physics. We don't care what happens on scales where all that happens is things oscillate. Okay, so this was justification number one. Justification number two is unitarity. So if you do effective field theory, then what we do is we take all fields that are present, including the gravitational field, including the gravitons. We expand in Fourier modes, in co-moving Fourier modes, and we quantize each Fourier mode like a harmonic oscillator. So that's the effective field theory approach to cosmology. Now, in order to avoid the Planck catastrophe, we have to introduce an ultraviolet cutoff. But this ultraviolet cutoff has to be at a fixed physical scale, not a fixed co-moving scale. To maintain this UV cutoff in an expanded universe, you have to continuously create new modes. And this is extreme non-unitarity. The Hilbert space is time dependent. So if we want this unitarity not to affect physical observables, then we again get exactly the transplankian sensitive conjecture. So this is um, justification number two. The side comment on justification number two, there's a famous quantum aspect of the cosmological constant problem. And this comes exactly from viewing matter as consisting of fields, which are treated as harmonic oscillators and each harmonic oscillator has a ground state energy. If this is the wrong approach, then the quantum aspect of the cosmological constant problem takes a very different form. And you will see that emerging at the very end of the talk. In the model that I will present, there is no vacuum part of the cosmological constant problem. Okay, now the third justification for the Transplankian censorship conjecture is thermodynamics. So those of you who've studied black holes and uh, who've studied recent developments in black hole physics, they know that there's a lot of talk about entanglement between things inside a black hole and outside of a black hole. In the same way, there's entanglement between things inside and outside of the Hubble horizon. And if you have an accelerating universe, then this entanglement entropy grows in time. And if we demand that the entanglement entropy density remains smaller than the entropy that we want after inflation, you get exactly the same constraint on inflation that comes from the Transplankian censorship conjecture. So these are three justifications for the Transplankian censorship conjecture, conjecture. If you violate that, you violate unitarity and you violate the second law of thermodynamics. So what does it mean for inflation? This is my space-time diagram of inflation that you already saw before. Vertical axis time, horizontal axis space, Planck length, Hubble horizon. I drew the Transplankian censorship conjecture to be marginally satisfied in that the initial Planck length evolves to be exactly the Hubble horizon at the end of inflation. But if inflation is to be successful, then the present, T naught is a present time, the present Hubble radius has to emerge from inside of the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. So we have a upper bound on the duration of inflation, which comes from the Transplankian censorship conjecture, a lower bound, which comes from demanding that inflation solves what it is supposed to do. So this is what the upper bound gives us. This is what the lower bound gives us. If you combine them, you find a bound on the energy scale of inflation, which is about five orders of magnitude lower than what you would like. And if you manage to construct an inflationary model which satisfies this bound, and this is very hard, then you get a completely negligible amplitude of primordial, primordial gravitational waves. So if anyone tells you in a talk that primordial gravitational waves, the discovery of those is a smoking gun signal of inflation, they are lying to you. The Transplankian censorship conjecture also implies that dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. Okay, so if inflation is in trouble, then what does this mean? Does this mean that early universe cosmology is in trouble? The answer is no, because there are, there are several scenarios of early universe cosmology which are consistent with current data. 
And this is an example of current data. So this plot shows you the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background. So the horizontal axis is angular scale, large angular scales, small angular scales. The vertical axis shows you the amount of structure on the particular angular scale. The data comes from um, WMAP. So the black are the data points with some statistical errors on small angular scales, which are now much smaller. And there's some statistical uncertain systematic, but there's a cosmic variance uncertainty on large angular scales. And uh, the red curve is a six parameter fit to large to late time cosmology, which fits the data fairly well. Six parameters of late time cosmology. Now, the people who first discussed the physics that goes into that plot are Zeldovich and Zunyayev, and independently Peebles and you. And this is a plot from the Zeldovich and Zunyayev paper of 1970, 10 years before inflation. So the physics that goes into this plot that produces all these nice features was understood 10 years before inflation. Here's a graph from the Zeldovich and IF paper. This is the time when the microwave background is released. This is the Big Bang time. This curve here, which I'm uh, plotting, which I'm sketching out with my cursor, this is the Hubble radius in uh, before recombination. And here I'm drawing the horizontal axis as co-moving co coordinates, spatial coordinates. In co-moving coordinates, the wavelength of fluctuations is constant. Now, fluctuations only start to oscillate when they enter the Hubble radius. So they are frozen, and you should view them as standing waves on scales larger than the Hubble horizon. So if you hit a fluctuation at large amplitude, then you will get large microwave anisotropies. If you hit the fluctuation mode when it is at its node, only velocity perturbation, then you will get a minimum in the microwave anisotropies. So the wavelength that enters the Hubble radius right at recombination, we catch it as a standing wave which has not yet had time to oscillate. This wave has done five quarters of an oscillation. We catch it at a node, only velocity perturbation. This is a minimum of the microwave anisotropies. So the features which are illustrated in this plot, these oscillatory features, they explain precisely these oscillatory features which you see. This is the mode which has entered the Hubble radius at recombination. This is the mode which has done one quarter of an oscillation. This has done five quarters of an oscillation and so on. So these features were well understood 10 years before inflation and all you need to get them is you need to have some primordial fluctuations on scales larger than the Hubble radius before recombination. So what I said is summarized in this plot. Now, the criteria for successful early universe cosmology are the following. First of all, the horizon that we see at recombination has to be much, much larger than the Hubble radius in order to explain the isotopy of the cosmic microwave background. Secondly, in order to have a causal structure formation mechanism, then at some time in the early universe, the scales that we measure today have to be inside of the Hubble radius. And if, if you manage to satisfy these two criteria, you also have to have a mechanism for producing a roughly scale invariant spectrum of perturbations, which means that the amplitude of these fluctuations in position space is independent of wavelength. Okay, so these are the three criteria which you as quantum gravity researchers have to satisfy if you want to construct a new model of quantum gravity for the early universe. And here are three scenarios in which these criteria can be satisfied. Inflation, you see the horizon is exponentially larger than the Hubble radius. Scales that we observe today start out sub-Hubble. This I already explained. 
Now, this is a second scenario, which is a bouncing cosmology. Here, the size of the universe, the cosmological scale factor, starts out in a contracting phase. There's new physics that gives you a bounce, and then you have standard Big Bang expansion. This is the corresponding space-time diagram, my co-moving spatial coordinates, time, bounce time, contracting phase, expanding phase, Hubble horizon. This is the wavelength of stuff that we observe today. The horizon is infinite because time runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. Criterion one is trivially satisfied. From this graph, you see that if you go back far enough in time, everything that we observe today starts out sub-Hubble. Criterion two satisfied. And then in the same way that in certain classes of accelerating models, you can get scaling around spectra of fluctuations in certain classes of uh, bouncing cosmologies, you can also get scaling event spectra. So this is scenario two. Scenario three is an emergent universe. And in the emergent universe, we postulate that there's a quantum gravity epoch, which might not even have a conventional space-time description, conventional general relativistic space-time description, but which looks quasi-static. And then there's a phase transition to standard Big Bang expansion. So this is the postulate that underlies the emergent universe. The space-time diagram that emerges is this one. So this is the primordial epoch, quasi-static from an effective field theory point of view. This is the phase transition time, standard Big Bang expansion. The horizon is infinite because time runs from minus infinity to, to plus infinity. As you see here, scales that we observe today start out with a wavelength smaller than the Hubble radius. So therefore the second criterion is satisfied. And then the thing that I will show you in a little bit is that if you start out with thermal fluctuations in this emergent phase, and if these thermal fluctuations have holographic scaling, then you automatically get scaling variant spectra of both cosmological perturbations and gravitation waves like for inflation. So these are three scenarios. So the bottom line from this part of the talk is that there's not just inflation. There are other scenarios of early universe cosmology which can be consistent with the data. So if your quantum gravity model does not like inflation, like string theory, string theory doesn't like inflation, there's nothing to worry about. Maybe there's something better. Maybe there's an emergent universe. Okay. So... However, in all of the models, in all of the scenarios that I presented, you have to go beyond effective field theory. Because in order to get a cosmological balance, you have to go beyond Einstein gravity coupled to regular matter. In order to get an emergent universe, you have to go beyond Einstein gravity because you don't get a static phase with matter from Einstein gravity. And I just argued that even if we want inflation, we have to go beyond effective field theory. So all early universe scenarios require beyond going beyond effective field theory. So now I'll introduce you to a toy model of an emergent scenario. And this is string gas cosmology, which dates back to prehistoric times, namely before the invention of the archive. So this is work of Waffer and myself. So our idea was, let's just see what happens in cosmology if we replace point particles by fundamental strings. Let's look at the new degrees of freedom, which strings have, which point particles do not have, and the new symmetries, which string theory has, which are lost in an effective field theory. And strings have internal degrees of freedom. They have oscillatory modes. And that leads to a maximal temperature that a gas of strings can have. They also, String windy modes, like if you imagine your space as a torus, then you can wind the torus with a string. You can never wind a torus with a point particle. And this leads you to a new symmetry, namely that physics at large radii is equivalent to physics at small radii. And the energy of string winding modes is proportional to the radius energy of center of mass motion of strings is proportional to one over the radius. So this is duality, R goes to one over R. 
symmetry of perturbative string theory. It's a symmetry of non-perturbative string theory as well. So what happens if you take up a gas of a box of strings with radius r and you decrease the radius of this box? Initially, the temperature will rise because the energy is all in the light degrees of freedom, the string momentum modes. But as a density, as a temperature approaches the maximal temperature, then the energy is so large that you can excite the oscillator degrees of freedom. And eventually you os you excite the winding modes. And once you can, once it's energetically preferable for the energy to drift into the winding modes, then if R decreases, the temperature will go down. So there's no temperature singularity in string theory. Now, how wide this plateau region is depends on the total entropy of the system. And this wide plateau region led us to postulate that the effect of cosmology was that which you just saw before, a quasi-static Hagedorn phase. This is the Hagedorn phase when you have a thermal gas of strings close to the Hagedorn temperature, followed by a transition in which three of the spatial dimensions are liberated to become large. So we get this space-time diagram, and now we can compute observables. So we are taking a toy model of quantum gravity and we are computing observables. And the observables which we are computing will be the density fluctuations and the curvature perturbations. The curvature, curv curvature perturbations which give anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, the density perturbations which give us um, struck galaxies. So the method that we do that is we compute the matter correlation functions in the emergent phase. And then we do that wavelength by wavelength. And for each wavelength, we convert the matter fluctuations to metric fluctuations on once the length scale crosses the Hubble radius, which is a length scale when the effect of um, low energy theory becomes applicable. And then we evolve the fluctuations to late times using the usual theory of cosmological perturbations. Now, this recipe is a recipe that you will be able to apply in your new quantum gravity model, the new quantum gravity model, which you will develop. So you will have this new quantum gravity model, which will be called um, uh, JYQG model. And uh, you will calculate the matter correlation functions. See, your quantum gravity model will have to include matter as well, because we have matter today. So you will calculate the matter correlation functions in the early phase. We will follow the wavelength of the matter fluctuations to late times. And we will convert the matter fluctuations to curvature perturbations using the equations on the next slide. And then we are in business. So I've spent a lot of time on this slide because this is the recipe that you're going to use. And these are the equations that you're going to use. So this is a metric that includes small amplitude curvature perturbations and gravitational waves. Curvature perturbations, gravitational waves. These are space dependent. The rest, the blue is space independent. The curvature perturbations are given by the energy density fluctuations, which you're going to compute in your new quantum gravity model. The gravitational waves are given by the off diagonal pressure perturbations, which you will compute in your your new quantum gravity model. Now we computed them in string gas cosmology. In string gas cosmology, the specific heat capacity uh, determine, determines the density perturbations and the specific heat capacity has this holographic scaling. So this follows from the partition function of strings. And then you plug these equations together and out pops. I'm not leaving out any steps. I'm just not explaining how you go from one line to the next line, but there are no low e equations missing. The bottom line is that the result doesn't depend on K because the temperature is almost constant during the emergent phase. And so therefore you get a scaling event spectrum of cultural perturbations like for inflation. And if you work a little bit harder, then you see that you get a slight red tilt like for inflation. You compute the gravitational waves in a similar way then you find a scaling event spectrum like for inflation, and you find a blue tilt of gravitational waves unlike for inflation. 
Because in your new quantum gravity model, you don't just want to reproduce what inflation gives us. You want to, you want to produce, you want to uh, make predictions with which your quantum gravity model can be tested against observations. In our toy model of quantum gravity, this slight blue tilt is the prediction with which it can be distinguished from the conventional effective field theory model. So when um, when T is a hydrogen temperature, I mean, the quantities vanish? The, uh, That's the right. That's and, right. So yeah. you see in inflation, the temperature of regular matter is zero. And therefore you don't have thermal fluctuations. In regular inflation, you have quantum fluctuations. Here mm -hmm. in this scenario, the quantum fluctuations are completely negligible compared to the thermal fluctuations. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay. okay so thanks. now in the remaining five or seven or eight minutes, I will turn to our model. So now this model may be completely wrong. I'm not a string theorist, but hopefully I've motivated to you that we should look beyond effective field theory. This is our approach, and this is work done in collaboration with Shudo Brahma, who's now in Edinburgh, and uh, my excellent student, Samuel Laliberte, who will be speaking in your series very soon. So we are starting with a matrix model. And in this matrix model, there is no space. There's only time. There's a set of matrices. There's a set of 10 n by n Hermitian matrices. And there's an eta mu nu symbol in the Lagrangian for this matrix model. And it's because there's an eta mu nu symbol in this Lagrangian, this is why Lorentz invariance, local Lorentz invariance will emerge. So this matrix model was proposed as a non-perturbative definition of superstring theory because perturbative calculations, which you can do in this matrix model, agree with corresponding perturbative calculations, which you can do in string theory. This is the Lagrangian for this matrix model. No space, they are n by n matrices. I will take n to infinity. And there's something that looks like a kinetic term. There's something that looks like a potential term. And in this thing that looks like a kinetic term, there's this 10th matrix. There are nine X matrices. There's one matrix which arises in this thing that looks like a covariance. So this is a well-defined Lagrangian. So we will choose a state. And well, we choose a thermal state, a high temperature state. So now we have no more time because in this high, in this given this state, there's no evolution. Now, what we can do in this finite temperature state is we can expand all matrices in Matsubara modes. We expand them in Euclidean time direction. And we choose the temperature to be so large that the action is dominated by these small n equals zero modes, by the modes which are homogeneous in the Euclidean time direction. And it turns out that the action of those modes is the same as the action studied in a different matrix model, namely this action here, which involves 10 n by n matrices. So here there's an action, there's no time, no space, there's only a partition function. So space, time, the metric, and the cosmology all have to emerge from this matrix model. And the idea is that we will use the homogeneous modes, the n equals zero modes, the modes that obey this action, those components of the matrices will give us the background space time, and the other modes will give us the fluctuations. That's the idea. So let's turn to the uh, emergence of time. So we will take, these are n by n Hermitian matrices. We can diagonalize one of them. And we diagonalize the temporal matrix. And the eigenvalues of those, of that matrix, we will call these eigenvalues are instances of time. So we get instances of time. Now, numerical studies show that if you take the expectation value of the trace of this square of this matrix, one over n, it scales 
as a small constant times n. This implies that the maximal temporal eigenvalue scales as square root of n, and hence the difference between temporal values goes as one over square root of n. So therefore, in the n going to infinity limit, we get infinite continuous time. And these temporal eigenvalues are symmetric about zero. So the emergent time goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. No time singularity. Okay, so this is time. Now let's focus on the spatial matrices. So we continue working in the basis in which A0 is diagonal. And we look at the spatial matrices. And they have these following three properties. So if you take a spatial matrix and you look at off-diagonal elements, then these off-diagonal elements decay fast once you're sufficiently far away from the diagonal. And sufficiently far means further than NC given by this. These two properties you can show analytically. This last property, you we only have numerical evidence for that. And by we, this is this reference here. Okay, so now what we do is the following. We will pick our time and we will now go take a spatial matrix and we will go down the corresponding length. We will go down to the corresponding position along the diagonal. And we will take a little square matrix, small n by small n square matrix. And the small n will become our co-moving spatial coordinate. So now what we can do is we can take this small matrix positioned at time t. We can take the expectation value of the trace of the square of that matrix, and we call this the extent of space parameter. And again, it was shown numerically that there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking that out of these nine extent of space parameters, only three become large. Exactly the same phenomenon that happens in string gas cosmology. String gas cosmology, there's a, so strings keep six dimensions compact, allow only three to expand. Okay, so now in the three dimensions which become large, we will call this the square of the physical length of a curve that goes from n equals zero to n. So we now have co-moving coordinates. We have the physical length of a curve. So we have space that is emergent. And once we have this definition of length, we get the emergent metric. This is the usual general relativity formula that relates the metric to the length. Okay. So we have emergent time, which is infinite runs, continuous runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. We have emergent space in which three dimensions emerge. They are infinite in the end going to infinity limit. We have an emergent metric and this emergent metric is spatially flat. Uh, Robert, can I ask a question? Yes. So uh, this uh, symmetry breaking from uh, in 10 dimensions or nine dimensions down to six and three. Is that is that a right. choice or? Is, no, that's is not that a, a choice. This is, this is determined. The matrix model only allows three spatial, three spatial dimensions to become large. Okay. This is, this and, is the beauty. In right. a, a matrix model is only anomaly free if we start oh. off with nine spatial matrices. So the number of space dimensions is determined by quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. right. It is in string theory. But the, the quantum mechanical mechanism allows only three dimensions of space to emerge. Okay. And in those three dimensions, what emerges is a spatially flat metric. Okay. okay. I mean, okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'm almost out of time. And the last, um, I will only tell you very briefly. So you can now study how the size of the three dimensions grows. Again, this is given by the time evolution of this A of T, which is given by this 
which is given by this. So we, we have a partition function of the matrix model. We can calculate, calculate all of this. It's not, uh, no free parameters. What we find is power law growth. There's no inflation. There's no cosmological constant. There should be no cosmological constant because we are never quantizing a harmonic oscillator. And therefore, there is no quantum vacuum oscillator cosmological constant problem. Okay. Now, we have the thermal fluctuations because we are starting in a thermal state. We have the small n not equal to zero modes. And you won't be surprised if I tell you that if we calculate the thermal correlation functions in exactly the same way that I showed to you in string gas cosmology, then we will get the same results. So we use the same recipe that I told you in string gas cosmology. We start with the well-defined partition function. We calculate the matter correlation functions in the emergent phase. Mode by mode, we convert the matter fluctuations to metric fluctuations on length scales which cross the Hubble radius, and then we evolve to late times. We calculate the curvature perturbations and the gravitation waves. And the bottom line is we find exactly the same things that we found in string gas cosmology. We found scale invariant spectrum of curvature perturbations, a scale invariant spectrum of gravitational waves. And so we've basically argued that starting from this well-defined matrix model, BFSS matrix model, that we can, if we take this model in a thermal state, we can obtain an emergent infinite space, an emergent infinite time, emergent spatially flat metric, and an emergent early universe cosmology with thermal fluctuations, which lead to scale invariant curvature perturbations and gravitational waves. And there's no cosmological constant. So this is a research avenue, which obviously there could be many holes in it. There are many things which need to be studied. So far, we have not taken into account the fact that in this matrix model, there are fermionic matrices because the matrix model is a supersymmetric matrix model. So we need to include the fermionic matrices. We need to understand the dynamics of the phase transition, which liberates three dimensions. We need to understand the emergence of general relativity as an effect of field theory in the infrared. We need, and that will allow us to then compute the spectral indices, the deviations of the spectrum of cosmological perturbations and gravitation waves from being exactly scale invariant. And at the end of the research program, we also have to try to find dark energy. So this, the research program is just at the very beginning. And uh, okay, now at this point, I want to summarize with two slides. One slide is a general messages that I want all of you to carry away from this talk. And the inflation is not the only scenario of early universe cosmology, which is consistent with current data. So in your work on quantum gravity, you need you don't need to force inflation into your model by, for example, by inventing an ad hoc scalar field. You don't want to do that. You just want to see what comes out of your quantum gravity model. Now, in light of the Transplankian censorship conjecture and other conceptual problems, effective field theory models of inflation are not viable. And so in any approach to early universe cosmology, we have to go beyond effective field theory. So if we translate the Transplankian censorship conjecture to late time cosmology, we find that dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. There are other reasons for believing that dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. So these are robust conclusions. Now, uh, the lesson that I took from these conclusions is that we should start from a model, which is not an effective field theory. And this is what we did. We started with the BFSS matrix model, and we have a prescription for obtaining emergent time, space, and metric. And in this matrix model, we started in a thermal state. So we had thermal fluctuations and we argued that we get scale event spectra of cosmological perturbations and gravitational waves, which means that this quantum gravity scenario leads 
to a successful alternative to inflation. But, and it is this slide that you should reproduce in the model of quantum gravity that you will develop. But I will go back to the previous slide. So thanks for paying attention. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, great talk. I think we have now still plenty of time for questions. And uh, yeah, maybe let's first uh, stop the recording.